Hello, everyone. It's Conor McDonald here from Policy Exchange, Head of Economics, and I'm joined with two of our senior fellows in economics, Dr. Jared Lyons and former Cabinet Minister Ruth Kelly, to discuss the plan for growth that the government has just introduced. Um, a huge change in the economic policy stance. Um, this included both the National Energy Guarantee, and the Energy Price Guarantee, rather, and the significant um, tax cutting measures that were implemented or will be implemented in the coming months. A really remarkable change in the fiscal stance. And I'd like to start by asking both of you, why do you think this has come about? And what do you think the implications are for Britain's growth in the long term? And are there any tax cutting measures in particular that you found most welcome? Why don't we start with um, Dr. Lyons? Well, it's great to be on this. Um, I thought this was a really serious economic statement. It can be viewed in economic, financial, and in political terms. But let's stick with the economics and your question. Why was this necessary? Since the 2008 global financial crisis, the trend rate of growth in Britain, and indeed across Western Europe, has really slumped. In Britain, trend growth was roughly 2.4% before that crisis has been about 1.4% since. And because of that trend rate of growth being so low, we've continued to be in this sort of mire where the Treasury has argued, wrongly in my view, for austerity 10 years ago to get the public finances in shape, and argued wrongly in the last couple of years that for tax increases to try and get the public finances in shape. What we've seen today is a clear reaffirmation of a change of direction. Rather than accepting that trend growth is low, the desire now is to raise the trend rate of growth with a pro-growth strategy. Very importantly, and hopefully, today's statement also would have removed the worries that this is a so-called dash for growth, as we saw with the maudlin of barber boom and busts. Those booms and busts just saw a boost of domestic demand. Very different today is a pro-growth strategy focused on the supply side, supply side reform, including more investments, more innovation, more infrastructure, and also focus on incentives through taxes. So a significant change of direction, and I still think it needs to land because the penny is only now dropping in terms of the financial markets that the UK is on a different trajectory. Execution is the next big issue, putting this into work and seeing if it does succeed. And uh, Ruth, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, it's definitely a bold change of direction. There's no doubt about that. And a recognition that the, um, the high tax, low growth economy was just go was going nowhere. Taxes were at the highest for, for 70 years. Uh, growth was, um, you know, is, we're on the verge, if not in already, the, the midst of uh, a recession. Uh, productivity has been stagnant since the financial crisis. So any growth there has been in the past pre-COVID has been driven by people joining the labour force, not by any uh, increase in productivity. So I think there's been a recognition from the top that a total change of macro direction uh, was, was necessary. And arguably, um, you know, there is a case uh, to do that. But it is a big gamble. And we've seen some of the reaction today in the financial markets because people aren't yet convinced that, that such higher levels of borrowing, as undoubtedly will, will be the case, will be able to be funded by higher levels of growth into the future. So I think the tax cuts that we've seen are designed to do two things. One, to jumpstart the economy, and they may well do that. But secondly, as, as Gerard Lyons has said, to really increase much out on whether the tax cuts alone can do that. Now, as uh, Gerard has said, there are also microeconomic uh, reforms in, the, in this package. There are reforms to investment zones, uh, the creation of investment zones, for instance. Um, there are reforms to encourage greater spending on, on infrastructure and the development of infrastructure. Um, but I would have liked to see a much more fundamental supply side reform package. So can I pick, pick you both up on that, on the supply side element, which is that in reading the growth plan, it's very clear that the government has ambition in this space and named a number of different areas, childcare, uh, investment, pension charge cap, for example, uh, planning, 
in infrastructure housing in these investment zones. This is really a massive, um, sort of a massive agenda. Um, and all of these will take legislative time. They will take a lot of policy thinking. So on, you raised the point about um, execution, Gerard. How should the government go about delivering these supply side reforms? And in particular, how should they prioritize um, with the ones that will make the biggest impact given the change in the fiscal stance? Okay, well, I think the immediate priority has been on the sort of current growth situation. Were it not for the policy changes announced in the last few weeks, the economy would undoubtedly be heading for a very deep recession. The markets were expecting that a few months ago. The economy still is slowing down and the technical recession might be unavoidable. But by capping energy prices and also by reversing the planned tax increases, I think that deep recession has been avoided. And that's the key immediate focus. Now, in terms of the supply side agenda, the difficulty with supply side agendas is that they don't happen overnight. And the Chancellor did allude to that early in his speech. The challenge for him, of course, and for the government is that they only have a couple of years before the election. So they hope to have some quick wins, but it does take time. The investment zones is very interesting. Rachel Rees, the shadow chancellor, was quite right in her reply that when we've seen such zones before, they've often just diverted investment from elsewhere. Perhaps mindful of that, what was interesting today was the chancellor tried to really uh, sort of sort of bulletproof these investment zones by offering them, quite frankly, so much. There's a whole plethora of things being offered to them. So they are really quite exciting. So I'm assuming that they would hope those really take traction immediately. The changes in terms of EIS, SEIS, VCTs, and IR35, really positive. Again, you would expect those to sort of start to have an immediate impact. But given an election two years' time, that might impact people's thinking as well. Um, importantly, from the market's perspective, I think the challenge is this. If you're the UK government, you can only control the controllables. You can't stand in the face of the markets. The dollar is so strong, it's difficult for the pound to buck that. Like yesterday, the Bank of Japan intervened, the yen having been at a 45-year low. In India, since mid-July, for instance, practically every day the headlines about the fact the rupee is still above 80 and it's a psychological impact. The euro has depreciated significantly. So it's hard for the pound to buck that trend, but that's going to set the narrative here. In terms of bond yields, I don't think it's just the, the borrowing issue. It's the fact that yesterday the Bank of England really didn't sort of knock worries on the head. And we now have a situation where policy rate in the UK is two and a quarter percent. The market's expecting four and a half percent. And I can tell you from long experience in the markets, when you still think you're a long way from policy rate, that tends to really be the driving force in terms of setting thinking in the bond market. So the bond market is in a very febrile move, largely because they still think interest rates have a long way to go to they peak. And that means that anything that announces an increase in borrowing isn't always going to be well received. So it's a difficult environment, uh, but all the Chancellor can do is hopefully, in his mind, put down the economic marker, hope that the economics is seen as being successful. Uh, that will probably take time to win over the plaw of critis critics, shall we say, and the markets probably will be still volatile in the near term. That's the challenge for him. That's a really interesting... It's, it's remarkable, the, the point you make, which is that so many of the elements uh, are outside of the UK government's control. I think the, the, the most obvious example of this is the energy price shock. But I want to focus on another one, which is that in many of these um, deregulatory supply side areas, childcare, investment, you're relying in part on ostensibly and in some cases uh, legislatively independent organizations. So the PRA, for example, Ofsted, um, the FCA. Both of you have kind of engaged with the at the very heights of government. How does a government push through a deregulatory supply side agenda when some of the levers belong to um, ultimately maybe accountable to parliament, but fundamentally nonpartisan, non-political bodies um, who are ultimately carry the can for many of the the policy, much of the policy design. 
Um, if you could either both of you speak to kind of your experience in that area and what that might mean for a supply side agenda, that would be that would be really interesting. If I could start with you, Ruth. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the absolute key is to get the framework right within which a regulator or um, government quanga operates. I mean, they do follow the law and they do follow the frameworks that, that are set out. So, so, for instance, the policy that all EU regulations will expire unless they are actively put onto the statute book by the current government will do a lot to change the focus of those agencies, such as the Financial Conduct Authority, uh, that are responsible for overseeing um, you know, the, the, the regulation of the city. Um, so, so getting that framework right, making it really clear what the what the government expects of them. Again, the um, making the competitiveness of the city of London uh, one of the key objectives of the FCA should should have an impact, uh, and then allowing the independent regulators uh, to do their job. The same goes for the Bank of England being very transparent about what it expects from the Bank of England. Uh, setting out its plans in sufficient depth, and arguably that will come a little bit later when the, when the figures are published and the OBR forecasts are published, and then allowing the bank the independence to set uh, the appropriate interest rate. I completely agree with Ruth's comments. It's difficult to add to them. The framework, the principle of course, being correct. Um, maybe just to approach it in a different way, just in terms of where the markets are at the moment, Mm -hmm. um, because you've mentioned regulators and other organisations. Uh, one of the challenges this government has faced in recent weeks, or indeed before it became governed, was about <clears throat> institutions. And um, the OBR, for instance, did not provide a forecast today. There's mm -hmm. worries about the relationship with the Bank of England. Um, I think what was clear from the Chancellor's statement is that he's trying to address those issues uh, he made the point that the Bank of England's independent is sacrosanct. Um, but as Ruth said, it's the frameworks and getting the principles in place and making, making sure that the people at the top of these institutions are aligned in thinking as well as understanding the framework. But uh, difficult to add to her answer. That's, that's really, um, really helpful. Thank you both. Um, Related to the to the supply side um, agenda, and but more broadly too, are there any areas where you felt the government could have been more ambitious? Obviously, this is a hugely ambitious package. But is there anything you would have liked to see more of um, in in what the government announced? Yeah, I, I, I have a few areas. So I think, um, as Gerard has said, the plans for investment zones are incredibly ambitious. But outside the investment plans, there's not much on um, on housing supply and trying to, you know, change the planning system to promote housing supply, for instance. I would have liked to see more on that. I look forward to seeing more on labour market uh, reform, in particular on how to increase the size of the labour force. Um, around 600 on the labour force from actively looking for work since, since COVID, for one reason or another, largely the over 50s. And there was hardly a mention of skills and education. And ultimately, in the long term, we need to have a skilled uh, labour force. Uh, so I look forward to much more to come uh, in those areas. Yeah, I, I concur with that. This is very much the, the marker. Uh, and there's quite a few things that now need to be filled in. And indeed, the Chancellor touched on that. You mentioned at the very beginning, Karen, about childcare, etc. Um, on housing, it's interesting because the... Rhetoric is always about supply. Ruth just touched on that. The change in stamp duty today was addressing a very important area, turnover. Um, stamp duty itself is always regarded as a stupid tax. It does deter turnover. Challenge, of course, is whenever stamp duty has been reduced in the past, it's only, shall we say, added to pr house prices. But um, hopefully this will have a longer lasting impact in terms of turnover. The supply side obviously needs to be addressed. Tax implication is a key issue. Um, of the measures today, the one I probably was least excited about was cutting the top rate of tax. Now, I, I say that partly because I think it diverted attention from all the rest of the package and it will grab the political headlines. But I can see why they did it because it's part of the tax simplification process. That now needs to be followed up in terms of income tax by raising allowances, getting rid of those high marginal rates of tax at 50,000, and if you're lucky enough to go over 100,000. So tax simplification there, then, then also tax simplification for the business sector more generally. 
And then the other big change is the one he touched on linked to the city. The banker's bonus aspect is the marker about the need to make the city competitive. That really now needs to be followed up with the opportunity to build a bespoke regulatory environment to suit the UK. So I think um, lots of changes there today, um, but I think there are a lot more things that now need to be followed through on as we touched on in this short video. Fantastic. One, one last question, um, and this is actually not really in the government's remit. What do you think happens to monetary policy now in the coming months? And how do you think the Bank of England has done and how should it move forward engaging with this new stance mm -hmm. from, from the Treasury and from the Chancellor? I mean, I'm personally not surprised that the Bank of England didn't raise interest rates more um, yesterday. And uh, the reason for that is they haven't seen the details of the government plan yet. Now, clearly, they would have been briefed in advance. But, you know, the figures are not there. They can't make an overall ex uh, assessment of um, uh, be in different, in different respects over what timelines and so forth. So I would expect in November a um, much more serious analysis of the impact of the looser fiscal stance on, on monetary policy, potentially a um, significant rise in interest rates at that point, but actually, arguably, uh, the balance between monetary and fiscal policy has been very skewed in recent years with interest rates very low uh, and now with high inflation, negative real interest rates. Uh, so that needs to be corrected, uh, at least partially, um, over the coming months. And Gerard? Yeah, well, the Bank of England has a self-created credibility gap and has a communication problem. My worry is two wrongs don't make a right. The Bank of England was wrong last year in terms of their monetary policy. They eased when they should have been tightening. Inflation was low. The economy could have coped with a much tighter monetary policy last year. The second wrong would be if they went on autopilot now and started to aggressively tighten. Because yesterday, the bank effectively said inflation's about to peak. The economy, in their views, is in recession, and yet they want to tighten rates aggressively. So I think they need to tread very carefully indeed. My view is that the fiscal policy measures we've announced, seen announced today are not inflationary. So tax cuts and fiscal changes are not the opposite end of the same seesaw as interest rate increases. So fiscal policy being eased should not mean that interest rates go up. And that's because of the nature of our inflation shock which has been largely supply side, bottlenecks, war in Ukraine, and largely through inappropriate monetary policy last year. It's not been because of the domestic overheating economy, in fact, the domestic economy is slowing. I think the bank needs to really look at the data and assess second round inflation effects, whether costs and wages and core inflation are picking up in coming months. So I don't think they should go on autopilot but I think the speed, the scale, and the sequencing of tightening, the sequencing between QT and rate hikes needs to be very sensitive to how the economy is performing. Mm. And of course, uh, Gerard's right in pointing out the sequencing being incredibly important. Yeah. So the bank, no doubt, will be focused on what happens to energy prices, for example, yeah. uh, two years from now, uh, when the price cap may well have come to an end. Um, there is such uncertainty over that forecast um, that the, the assumptions that they make will be absolutely critical uh, to, to the outcome uh, for both inflation and, um, and interest rates. Thank you very much, both. Um, you both highlighted sort of the, com the complexity of the challenges ahead in monetary and fiscal policy. And uh, let's hope that the, the growth plan um, has the desired effect. And uh, here's to many more conversations to come. Thank you both very much.